It says, hence, the words abide in me do not constitute a condition which man must fulfill in his own power before Christ will do his part. See, this is, this is my greatest revelation, that I'm the righteousness of God the day I got saved was all my issues, right? We, and if you've been here, we, we've talked about this a million and one times because you know I love it. It says that I don't have anything to fulfill before Christ will do his part. Far from it. It is sovereign grace from start to finish, but the responsibility of abiding in Christ is placed squarely upon man's shoulders exactly where it belongs. So Christ will do his job to pull you and plant you, but it's your job to stay planted. Because if you don't put any effort to stay planted, let me tell you something. There will be all kinds of stuff that comes that starts pulling on you and tugging on you and taking you back. Last week we talked about familiar spirits, and familiar spirits are looking for you right now. They are looking for you. It says, it says without exertion, there is no salvation. But the power to exert oneself and to preserve is God-given. That's like an oxymoron. That's like saying, wait a minute, which way do I go? First you're telling me if I don't give any effort, there's no salvation. But then the next thing you're saying, it's God's power that exerts in order to preserve me. It makes no sense. You're telling me to do it, but you're saying God's going to do it. See, it's, it does make a lot of sense. It's godly power working in us. I will do, he will do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we're able to ask or think. Okay, bam, comma, right? So right there it says, he will do, right? But it says, according to the power that works within you. That's the rest of it. Because, because you'll go somewhere and you'll hear the quotation, he will do exceedingly, mm, and abundantly. Mm. But it's according to the power that works within you. So the power has to be working in you in order for you to be able to operate in God. It's an, it's a, it's a, if you abide in me, I'll abide in you kind of thing. It's a reciprocating power. It's this, it's, it's this, if you give yourself up to me, I'll give myself up to you. If you work with me, I'll work with you. And see, a lot of times we ask God, God, show me you. God, give me more of you. No, 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 no. You give yourself more to God because he's done everything that he's going to do. Oh, this is awesome. God told me yesterday. I said, Lord, speak. He said, I've been speaking. I spoke once at the beginning of time and my words are like light and they have continued just because they're just getting to you doesn't mean I didn't speak it in times past. I said, oh, my God. See, I just wanted to hear God yesterday. I didn't want to talk to you. I wanted the revelation from God. He said, I spoke in the beginning and I said everything that I was ever going to say and my words are like light. They travel just like light does and light has came at the beginning of time and it has not stopped expanding in the universe. God's words, God's words does not speak and just because we're just hearing them does not mean that he didn't speak it in times past. It's just been revealed. Listen, revelation, revelation is like this. Revelation is like this. If it's in the book, it's still there. It's just hidden. Once light hits, that thing is revealed to you. You see what I'm saying? Light, light comes like that. It's just revealed to you. So if God is light and he has spoken from the beginning of time, all we have to do is be able to grab hold of the revelation. So who you are in Christ Jesus was given to you day one when you received Christ, but it takes a lot of information in order for you to understand who you are. So you get all this squirming, you get all this running around, you, get, you do all these other things instead of learning how to sit still because life tells us to move. But God's saying, listen, I am God. Be still and know that I am God. And the problem comes because we're used to being in control of our own destinies. And to relinquish that power, to relinquish that power where you are helpless. See, that's what they tell you when you go to them 12-step programs, that you were helpless. Right? Ain't that what they tell you? They ain't tell you that? Uh, no, 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 no. Huh? Powerless. Same. But I have power. 
I have God-given dunamis. I have God-given ability. Not only do I have authority, I have ability. But it has to be in a godly way because the Bible says that a man's gift will make room for him. So because a man's gift makes room for him, we must operate in a godly manner in order for the gift to make room. The gift might precede us. We may learn how to manipulate in the, in the gift, but we lose power in the gift when it's not gift doing it in God's way. So, so, so what happens is, it looks godly sometimes, but it's not necessarily godly. And this preservation, this, this power to preserve, God will preserve our salvation, but we will lose our life. There's enough stuff out here in the world that wants to eat at you and take away from you more than it is that wants to add to you. The world will use you up. And you can't see that the world's trying to use you up. All you're doing is saying, listen, this is the pride of life. And because this is the pride of life, life is going to be better for me if I operate in this manner. How many people you heard say, I tried, God. It didn't work. How's he work for some and not the other? How's he work for some and not the other? It's because they were squirming. Because they chose not to sit down and allow God to be ruler over their lives. They wanted to sit on the throne of their hearts. And because they wanted to sit on the thrones of their hearts, they went the other way that God chose for them. But the responsibility of abiding in Christ is placed squarely upon man's shoulders where it belongs. Oh God, please take this taste out of my mouth. Oh, God, please, I need a job, but won't go look for one. Oh, God, please, I need, but won't do. Oh, God, please. See, see, listen, a harvest only comes if you go pick the harvest. You have to go pick the harvest. So that means you have to get in the field and do your part of the work. God, listen, it says that a seed goes into the, oh, that's good. A seed goes into the ground and we don't know how it grows, right? It says, but when it, when it, when it sprouts up, first you see the, the blade, then the ear in the blade. And then when it's full, you go in and put the sickle in. You put the sickle in and pull forth the harvest. God says he does his part in making the thing grow. You have to go get it. You got to put the work in to be godly. In order for you to be godly, you must put the work in. This thing is not a, a, a light switch. I can turn God on, I turn God on. Let me tell you what happens. The light switch is in your flesh. It goes on and it stays on. You have to unplug from the world and plug into God. If you don't unplug from the world and plug into God, you will continue in your way. Because that's easy, that's familiar. Come on, give me the next slide, Alex. Let's get into the scripture. Oh, yes. Luke 11. Get my Bible out for this one. It says, but he knowing their thoughts said unto him, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and a house divided against itself against a house falleth. OK, so if man is brought against man, you are against yourself. Spirit man, flesh man, who eventually wins? Some of you might say spirit. No, you submitted. Once the spirit man wins, it's because you submitted. <coughs> See, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not into making us. The Holy Spirit wants honor. And because the Holy Spirit wants honor, you must submit your flesh to the spirit. The war happens when in your mind you say, this is not what I'm supposed to do. But when you push past spirit, see, listen to me. There's nothing that's going to restrain you physically. There's nothing that's going to hold you down and say, don't touch that. Don't taste that. Don't say that. Don't feel that. Don't go over there. Don't do that. There's nothing that's going to physically hold you down. So the spirit, the resistance that comes from the spirit is in your mind. Your mind tells you, in your mind, the Holy Spirit says, hey, don't go that way. When you push through it, there's nothing that's going to be able to pull you back but guilt, shame, grief. These are the only things that you're going to experience, and these things are mental. 
if you get to the point where you're numb to the Holy Spirit and you feel no shame and you feel no grief, you're in a dangerous place because now you're going to fall. This is where failure comes from. Because the conviction, the spirit part of this fight is coming to hold you down. And if the spirit man is strong, if the spirit man has been quickened, if the spirit man is alive, you'll resist. You see what I'm saying? You will resist. But when the spirit man is weak and the flesh is strong, that's when you push past the resistance of the Holy Spirit. Because, because you're not cognitive enough to be in your brain and realize that Holy Spirit is trying to stop me. These are just my thoughts. These are not your thoughts. See, see this, is the, this is what I have to tell you. Think about before you serve God. You didn't have really resisting thoughts to your flesh. There was no resistance. Anything goes. <laughs> and it, that's lasciviousness, a life with no restraints. Lasciviousness, no restraints. The restraints, the blockers, the defeaters come in to give you some resistance. When you don't learn how to yield to the Holy Spirit, when you don't learn how to yield your members to the Holy Spirit, you become servant of your members. And because you become servant of your members, you're not a servant of God. It just said that your exertion is lied on your shoulders. So, so what happens is you have the flesh screaming at you because this is real and this is tangible. And because you can touch and feel with these things, you think this is reality. But the spirit man is saying, listen, this is true reality. In him was life and in him was the light of men. See, you can't touch the light that's inside of you. You can't touch the life that's inside of you. You can't see the kingdom of God that dwells on the inside of you. You just have to walk by faith and not by sight. And by walking by faith and not by sight, some of the things that, see, that should be tangible you can't see. But when you realize that faith is a tangible substance, then you can walk by faith and not by sight, and then you heed to the resistance. You heed to the resistance. You heed to the, to the blocker that God... See, see, listen, the donkey saw the angel. The man couldn't see the angel, but the donkey saw the angel, and every time the donkey saw the angel, he would pause. The man would smack the donkey and say, why do you keep running? The donkey eventually said, the J.A. eventually said, man, why do you keep beating me, man? There's something right here you can't see. <laughs> and see, and see that, 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 thank you, Lord. That's what our flesh does. Why do you keep resisting? Why do you keep resisting? Because the flesh can't see the spirit. No flesh will glory in the presence of God. And so because the flesh can't understand what God's doing, he just wants to have his own party. He just wants to do what he's going to do. Just let me do what I'm going to do. It makes no sense why you don't want to. There's two of you. There's a house divided. And if both of them have equal opportunity in your life, you are going to lose. You are going to fail. A house divided against itself is brought to desolation destruction eventually listen eventually because the flesh has been so common because it has had dominion over your heart over your mind over your intellect over your imagination over your heart because the flesh has had dominion because it's ruled and had reign over your life and because of this fact because the spirit is so foreign God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Your flesh is trying to operate in your spirit, and it can't. And that's where you get backsliding. That's where you get people who try to come and nibble at God instead of feeding on God. 
because, because they'll, try, they'll take drips out of the cistern instead of turning the faucet on and just drinking. It says those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Those who try to take sips from God will never be filled. You will always be thirsty. Your flesh has an appetite, and because the flesh have a, has an appetite, it's never satisfied. The flesh is never satisfied, and because the flesh is never satisfied, it continues to try to feed. That's why you must hunger and thirst after righteousness, hunger and thirst after the things of God, hunger and thirst after the principles of God, hunger and thirst, because this hunger and thirst now satisfies the soul. And once the soul learns how to live in a spiritual way, the flesh has no more control over the soul. And because the flesh has no more control over the soul, he's wandering out here by himself. You want the soul to be lost. I mean, the flesh to be lost. You want him not to be able to find his way to you. That's crazy, ain't it? You want you. Look, there was a, when I was young, there was a T-shirt I, I, said, I saw somebody wear. He said, I've gone to look for myself. If I get back before I do, tell me to wait. <laughs> if Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because you say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man armed keep of his palace, his goods are in peace. Okay, the Bible says, the Bible says this. A man that has no control is like a city with no walls, right? So if you don't have any control over you, if you don't have any control over the spirit man, over the soulish man that lives inside of you, there is no peace. And see, and see, what you have to understand is the Bible says that sin is pleasure for a season. And because sin is pleasure for a season, the spirit man is suppressed because of the pleasure. The pleasure of the thing. The idea of the thing, the thought life that goes into, I'm turning up. And what it's doing is, it's, it's like dropping ice on the spirit. It's making you numb to the things of God. See, it wants you to not be able to hear God. See, if everybody in this room started talking all at once, and if I was God and I was talking to him and I wasn't yelling, he would never be able to hear me even though I'm speaking. Because the flesh is warring against the spirit. And because the flesh is warring against the spirit, it's not until you can focus on what I'm saying and suppress everything else that is speaking to you that you hear God. You have to suppress the world you have to suppress the flesh because there are men who suppress the truth in order for them to continue in the things of the world but you have to do the opposite of the world and you have to suppress the world and the flesh so you can hear God because see the devil will fuel your lie he will continue to feed your flesh he will continue to provide opportunity for your flesh and if he provides the right opportunities he knows that once you touch the right thing he you don't even need him anymore you don't even need him anymore. You'll run off with that thing. He like the quarterback. Go, Johnny, go. He be sitting back there cheering like, yeah. Want to do it again? Let's run the same play. Familiar. Run the same play. Run the same play. Run the same play. You're, you're winning at this. Run the same play. Matter of fact, I want you to get a little jazzy with it this time. Add a little spin in there next time. Because, because, because if your flesh is going to win, he's going to make sure it wins. See, see, he has nothing but the power of suggestion. See, for those who are without God, he has control. For those of us who are in God, he has suggestion. And see, you oh, just like, oh, God, just like Adam did in the garden, he handed over his authority to Satan. See, Satan could do nothing but, hey, hey, girl. <laughs> 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 
That's what he did. That's what he did. And he shows up. Listen, you know the Staples commercial with the easy button? He shows up with your easy button. Look, I can make life easy. I can make life easy. Just hit the button. Hit the button. And as we hit the button, listen, it's like a mouse running through the maze and getting the cheese. He sets the, he sets the mystery up for you. He sets the enigma up for you. He sets the trail for you. You run the trail, hit the easy button, the door pops open, you get the cheese. And as you keep doing that, you start learning the path. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he take from him all his armor where he trusted and divideth his spoils. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none, he saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. Okay, so, so you got an evil spirit. This is what I said last week. You got an evil spirit with you. You start learning the things of God. Holy Spirit invades your life. As the Holy Spirit invades your life, he kicks out the evil, right? He kicks out the evil. You doing good. You living for God. You praising for God. You praying every morning. You reading your Bible. You still trying to suppress the flesh. And you secretly, oh God, you are secretly desiring some things of the world. See, because God, you're not satisfied with this because it's not familiar to you. You don't understand God. You, you have this mock honor for God. You understand that God exists, but you have this emotional faith. And because you have emotional faith you, and you don't have this volitional faith and volitional faith is voluntary that when I can't see God, when I can't taste God and I can't see God, it's still for God I live and for God I die. But because it's an emotional faith and when God takes the training wheels off and you can't control the bike because you really didn't give full diligence and prudence to your walk with God. And because it was a mock relationship, the strong man enters in, he spools your stuff, he kicks your door down, and he takes residence. And because he takes residence, this thing, this thing, okay, oh, I got, about, I got ahead of myself. Okay, so this, this wicked spirit is, is now roaming about because you're in this emotional place and you're praising God and all these things and you've learned how to deal with uh, cigarette smoking. You learned how to deal with stealing. You learned how to deal with lying. Okay, this spirit, right? These spirits, whatever your proclivities are, whatever your vice is, whatever your lover is, Right. He says, I'm going to look for a new home. He can't find none because he's familiar to you and he's been assigned to you. Right. He's looking. He's looking for the home. He says, OK, I'm going to return back from where I came. Look, check this out. This is what this is like, ladies. Yes. What do you want? Hey, girl, you know. You know what I mean? And you shut the door like, and you walk away mad. He came. He came. My wife fell for that for years. <laughs> Look at her. She's shaking her head like, don't fall for it. That's what it's like. The evil spirit comes knocking. He wants back in. You got this wall of emotional faith and this emotional things with God going on. He says, okay, 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 okay. The Bible says that he goes and gets seven more. He says, and when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then he go and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. He goes and finds eight more things that you don't have a defense against. You like chocolate. You like roses. You like cards and candy and sweet nothings. He knows what you like. He knows the things to say to you. He knows what to put in your ear, right? 
because, because he knows these things, you have a defense against his face. And so because you have a defense against his face, he can't get in the door. But if he comes with gifts, <laughs> see, if my wife did that, I just come with some real nice shoes, like eight pair. <laughs> Pants. <laughs> Baby. She'd be like, what? <laughs> Can I come in? No. Come on, baby. You know, you know. Lead a bag? Uh-uh. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. I ain't leaving the bags. Can I come in? Can I come in? Look, and see, her, she gonna try to run games. Yeah, you can come in. You can come in. But once I'm in, I brought the seven more evil things, I'm back in. I'm in the house again. And now that I'm in the house again, you in trouble. You in trouble because you let me back in. And because you let me back in, game on. Because you have to understand that these spirits are hunters. Tactical. The devil is tactical and he's smart and he's intelligent. And because he's intelligent, he operates in intelligence. And because you were his home, he knows you. The Bible even tells, the Bible even tells, says this. He says, husbands operate in knowledge towards your wife. If you were married to an evil spirit, don't you think he's going to operate in intelligence trying to come back to you? Right. He's not a dumb spirit, no. dumb to the things of God, but towards flesh and you, but towards wickedness. A house divided against itself will fall. If devil cast out the devil, then, then of course he's going to fall. So he brings things more evil than, than what, what you have, have dealt with in order for, you to, for himself to get back in, in order for him to torment you. I said last week, he really does not care about what those other seven things are going to do. He just wants to get back in and torment you. But the reason why your state is worse than the last time is because now you're not dealing with one thing that was assigned to you. He brought seven more other things to assign themselves to you. And now you've got this crazy war going on inside. And because, and this is when you feel, this is what happens. You get all the way back into the pigsty. You get all the way back to where God met you and delivered you. And then you say, in my father's house, when I was praising God, when I had this emotional relationship with God, if I could just get back to there, look at the fight that you got to get through. You was dealing with one thing that had been assigned to you forever. We were born into sin and shaking into, shaping into iniquities. We had one thing that we had to fight, one thing. And that one thing started learning you and started gathering things that you liked. Of course, we know that. But you have one spirit to deal with. Backsliding says this, that I stepped into the kingdom of God. And I, when I stepped into the kingdom of God, there's no weapon that formed against me that would be able to prosper. And because I stepped into the kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit resides in me, there's no good, no evil thing that can dwell in here also. And because there's no evil thing that can dwell here either, I'm clean. And because I'm clean by the blood of Jesus Christ, all I need to do now is learn the things of the kingdom. Because if I learn the kingdom, the kingdom of the kingdom, then my flesh has no power. But what happens is we choose to backslide. We choose to do things other than what God tells us to do. And because we do things other than what God tells us to do, then we start taking on all these other spirits. And as we take on all these other spirits, it just does nothing but destroy us. It does nothing but destroy you. You have to, you have to just sit your little butt down, just sit still and just rely on God. Because if you don't, man, I'm telling you, if you don't rely on God, and the last state of the man is worse than the last. Why is it so hard for me to get back where I was, God? I get rid of all that stuff for you. You chose to go back and touch your lovers. You chose to go back and pick those things up. 
You chose to go back and taste that, feel that, love that, experience that. Play with it. I'm just going to do it one more time. I'm bored. I'm church people boring. Girl, look, look who you're calling. You ain't calling another girl. Well, you might be. Let's go to the club. Where the spirits reside. In the world. Let's go, let's go play in the world. Let's go to the playground and let's go play in the world. Let's go exercise our flesh. Let's go lift some flesh weights. Let's go and play in the world. And as we go play in the world, guess what the world says? Hey, he's back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. <laughs> Come on, Alex. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and under the power of his might. So this word power is translated to this Greek word called kratos. Kratos meaning rule, right? So God's saying, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and under the rule of his might. See, see so now you have to start making a decision, who's going to rule my life? Who's going to rule my life? Is it going to be my decision-making or pre-decision-making, presupposed decision-making from God? Presuppositions, pre-things that we know about God, that God is holy. Okay, if God's holy, then that has already resided in me, and that means that I make my decisions based off holy situations. See, see, we know God's holy. We know Jesus. These are presupposed things. Christ died on the cross. We can't debate those things. Christian schools of thought can't debate those things. We know that Jesus' blood has cleansed us of all unrighteousness. We can't debate those things. Okay, we know that God, God says, I am holy, so you be holy. Okay, so we know these things. So when the war comes, it should be, a, the decision's already been made. Don't let this man speak to this man. You know the cartoon? You got good angel. Well, the good angel and the bad angel, and they be talking, zah, 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 Jamal, huh? Don't do that. He say, hey, man. He always look like the wolf with the zoot suit on, with the hat cocked to the side. He laid back. He be like, hey, Jamal, come on, man, you know. We had a good time. And he's saying, another one saying, don't do it. Don't do it. God is calling you. And the, angel, the devil said, man, don't listen to him. He's a chump, man. He's a punk, blah, 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 blah. He says, shut up. That's how I feel sometimes because the flesh is so strong. And because you keep dabbling in the world, the world makes you feel obsolete when you serve God. You have no authority when you're not in this kind of setting. You don't take authority in the world. You give them authority. Holy Spirit says, tell them about me. And you'd be like. He says, tell them. And, 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 and nine times out of ten, when he tells you to tell that person, he's already been priming them. He's already been priming them to receive what you're getting ready to say because they have been laying home on their bed crying to God. But because you're scared and worried about what they're going to think about you, you keep your mouth shut and go along with the sin. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and under the rule of his might. Come on, Alex. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, be able to stand against the methods of the devil because he has methods. So what happens is you have to be armed in order to be able to deal with this. Come on, Alex. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, angels, against powers, angels, against the rulers of darkness of this world, angels, against spiritual wickedness in high places, angels, demons. I say angels. Well, wait a minute. Yeah, demons are angels. Demons are angels. Angelic beings who have power. They're just malevolent. They're not benevolent. They're just wicked. 
principalities. Listen to this. But against principalities, rulers, against them who are able to govern. Listen, have you ever thought why certain areas and towns are so worse than others is because they have principalities that govern over them and they have the ability to push buttons and make things happen. There's a there's a there's a there's a, a principality over this town that deals with slothfulness, that deals with lack, that keeps people suppressed, not wanting more, not desiring to learn more, not desiring to be more. There's a principality over this town of mediocrity. Yes. And, and, and this is the thing. I was talking to my friends right at, at, at the funeral the other day. And I said. You know, I look at this group of friends that we had, and they never did what we did. And our outcomes are the same. We didn't accomplish anything, and neither did they. Only thing we did was make life worse for ourselves by the charges that we caught. And they're like, okay, okay. I said, so take the gift of ambition that we had. Take the gift of ambition that we had and put us in another setting and expose us to something different. And just the gift that's inside of me, just the gift of intelligence, just the gift of ambition, exposed to something else, I would have never caught one charge. Because what you have to understand is, is that if I'm trying to make a way for myself even though it's wrong, and they're just living life and not really trying to be ambitious about increase, if you just expose one group of people to the right thing, they would exceed it in life. Exposure. See, see, for we wrestle against not flesh and blood. See, the reason why I ran around the street and did everything is because that principality that was governing this town, he started pushing my buttons because I didn't know God. He had control over me. And the Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. At the moment that I started resisting, I mean, submitting myself to God, he empowered me to resist. You see what I'm saying? He gave me the authority. He gave me the ability to resist the devil. Now the devil has become not even an afterthought. He has no thought. He has no power in my life. And because he has no power in my life, he attacks the things around me. Because if he can attack the things around me, then he can hinder progress. But if we all learn to submit to God and resist the devil, there will have to be another group of people that come in here that we have to teach how to submit to God. But until this house learns to submit, there will still be an attack in your life. And you'll be governed by the principality. You'll be a redeemed person, saved, sanctified, set apart for the work of God. But because you don't have the information or you won't heed to the information that's given to you, you'll still be ruled by the principality against the powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. You can say, God, I love you. You can pray to God. But when you walk out the door, guess who's sitting there? The Bible says that sin is crouching at the door. And what he's doing is he's sitting there waiting for you to step out into the world with no power with no authority and with no armor because if you don't have your armor on you are open door for him come on Alex wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand withstand in the evil day and having all, done all stand that, you know what this tells me as I go about fighting in life I'm going to take some bruises and after I've done everything with my sword, after I've done everything with my shield, after I kick, punch, scratched, don't go back the other way. After I've done all that I was able to do, stay it. Take the lumps. Take the lumps. Because if you take the lumps, then, then, then after you stop fighting, then he has to deal with God. Come on. Come on. Stand there for having your loins girt about with truth. Man, man listen, listen. Tighten up your lust. Tighten up your lust. Put the belt on. Tighten up, tighten up the things that are drawing you to other places. Keep your pants right. And I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about whatever it is that draws you. Tighten up your lust. Come on. Oh, oh, oh. And having the breast, the breast, oh. Listen, this covers the biggest part of your body. 
the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. We are the righteousness of God by faith. And because we are the righteousness of God by faith, you have to understand who you are first in order to be able to fight in a battle. Listen, the righteousness of God gives you rights in the kingdom. It gives you authority in the kingdom. It's like saying, now you are not necessarily in the fight. I'm fighting for you. You have right standing with God. Come on, Alex. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The word of God must lead you. The Bible says that your word is the light to my pathway. So therefore, that where you go, the word must go with you or at least lead you. Because if you follow the word, it will lead you to peace. It will prepare you and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Semicolon. Stop right there. Walk in the word. Walk with God. Walk with God. You have peace. Walk outside of God. You going to war. Come on. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Don't think because you switch sides, he won't attack. But listen, a shield keeps you from getting hit. The weapon has been formed, the things are shooting, but it's not prospering because you're walking by faith. The shield of faith, that the shield of faith is up, and because the shield of faith is up, there's nothing that can get to you. You have, you have the, the, the breastplate of righteousness. You have your feet covered. You're walking in the right places. But the enemy is still pursuing you. And because the enemy is still pursuing you, you have to understand that he's shooting his arrows at you. It says, though, though, the, rep, uh, though the trial of our fight, faith is more precious than gold. So what this is telling me is, is that the faith is, goes under trial. Not you. Your faith goes under trial. So if you keep the shield of faith up, if you keep the shield of faith up as the enemy attacks, this is the thing that's being tried, not you. And it's not God that's trying you, it's the enemy that's trying you. And so many times we say, God is testing my faith. <coughs> Why would God put you under trial like that? You are the righteousness of God. Your faith has already been exhibited in his son. See, we think, we think that we have to go under some scrutiny in order to go to the next level. I, I, <laughs> I can tell you in 11 years, this has been the easiest time of my life. Most people say, man, walking with God is so hard. I've been through so many trials and tribulations. <laughs> oh, Deacon, sing that song, Deacon. Jesus, I, I have an enjoyment walking with God. There has been nothing that's been able to stop me from doing the things that God has called me to do. There has not been one thing that has come my way that, in, that has hindered me from walking with God. Not one. Everything that comes has been dealt with. Everything that comes is dealt with. And you have to have that mindset. Come on, Alex. Come on. Come on. Get, me, get me to it. And take the helmet of salvation. That's what I'm talking about. You've got to have the right mindset. You have to protect your mind. Listen, listen to me. We are mental beings. We're the only beings on this planet that have the ability to make distinct and very advanced thinking. I don't care what a monkey can do. He can't do what we can do. And so the enemy is after your mind. Go back. Go back. Where are you at? And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Okay, let's check this out. Take on the helmet of salvation so we protect our mind, right? We got the shield up. Our feet are covered. Our breastplate is covered, right? Guess what he gives you? Some offense. He gives you some offense. Not only, not only do you defend yourself, not only are you armed to withstand the wiles of the devil, but it gives you the ability now to fight back. 
Listen, there's some people that the devil don't want to try. You know, you know, you don't really want to do that. You over there with all that rah 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 in your mouth. You know, you really don't want to do that, devil. Because when you know, when you know, and you know that he can't win, and you know who you are, and you know that you're not going to entertain the things that he comes at you with, the only thing he can do is go on to someone else. He can only go on to someone else because I have the sword of the spirit. I fight for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The very first strongholds we pull down are ours. Before we can help somebody else in their life pull down strongholds, the very first strongholds you pull down, the very first barriers you pull down are the ones in your life. Once those barriers are destroyed and you're not allowing the rebuilding of the wall, there's nothing the devil can do. He has to go on somewhere else. He has to go on somewhere else because the spirit of God is your defense. He says, in the shadow of the almighty, I find my secret place. Listen, he can't even find me because Jesus says he has no place in me. And if Jesus says he has no place in me, then if I'm in Christ and I understand exactly who I am and I know how to operate in the armor that has been given to me, check this out. Saul gave David his armor. David put it on and he didn't know how to use it. He said, I can't operate in this. This is why it's important to know who you are. It's important to listen in church and it's important to gain godly information and then exercise it. Because when the battle comes, you better be able to use that shield. You better be able to use that sword because if you can't, you'll go in all clumsily into a battle and the enemy's going to defeat you. Because of this emotional relationship you're going to have, you're going to look like God and not op op operate like God. And looking like God and operating like God is two different things. Because let me tell you something. David said, I don't need nothing but a rock and a rag. You give me a rock and a rag and I'll, de I'll destroy that enemy and I'll take his head off. See, see... When you know who you are, man, you, gotta, you, have to, you have to have great understanding of you. God, we know who God is. Listen, I don't care on what degree it is. I don't care who you are in this room right now. We know who God is. We might not have great theological terms. We, not, we all might not be called to preach. But we all know God because he has revealed himself to us. He's given me the ability to be a blowhorn, run my mouth. But we know God. But when you know who you are in God, now there's advancement. He said, stop telling me who I am and hear who I told you you were. He says that you are more than a conqueror, that you are the head and not the tail, above and not below. Y'all know the preaching, right? Y'all know that. That's who you are. But if you can't see who you are, you'll leave out of this door today. Check this out. You will leave out of this door today and you will continue in wickedness because you have no understanding. I believe in God. I know who God is. But because I don't know myself, I don't know how to live this way. I don't want to play with God, Pastor. You can't. You can't play with God. He's too big. He's so much bigger than whatever you into. And I'm so glad that I was in so much pain when I came to God that I didn't care about playing with him. I knew that I had so many self-inflicted wounds. I was tying my own self up. I was gagging my own self. I was cutting myself. Not literally. Some of y'all don't know me. Y'all know how I talk. In my mind, yes. 
Might as well have been slitting my own wrist, killing myself. Many nights, straws up my nose. Many nights, drunk beyond belief, driving foolishly, can't see. Driving an hour to my wife's house, high out of my mind, pulling the driveway and say, how did I get here? I can't remember none of those 60 some miles. Looking crazy. <laughs> Waking up the next day, face hurt, all my sinus cavities hurting, eyes hurting, <laughs> drunk, stomach hurting. And what I do? Because I didn't know who I was and because those things were dictating life to me, I'd get up and do the same thing. The next weekend, the next day. She said weekend. I wasn't no weekend warrior. I was in that thing. I don't know what you're talking about. Weekend. I had no job. I had no responsibilities. Uh, at least I didn't think I had kids that I wasn't trying to take care of. I just wanted to turn up. Because it dictated life. It dictated life for me. That spirit. Listen, my family spirit. That was a familiar family spirit. My family had the same problem I had. Familiar. And until I changed families, until I became a, in the family of God, until I broke away from that familiar spirit and took on the Holy Spirit, yes, yes, yes. was I able ever to break away from those things that I can tell you today that I truly fell in love with? A love that caused me pain. So I don't know what you've done what you've been into, I really don't care because I've probably done it too. But let me tell you something, until you switch sides, because if you're living in a house divided, you are not going to win. And until you choose a side, and if you choose the wrong side, listen, listen, you choose the wrong side, when you're done playing and you're done with your immaturity, because the Holy Spirit deals with your immaturity. He tells you, you're getting old, you've been doing this too long. And, and the problem is, is that we look like we win in this area. We look like we have dominion in this area. We look real good in this area. And if you come over here, you don't know the first step to take. That's why the Bible says that the Spirit of God will lead you and guide you into all truths. You don't have to know anything over here. God will lead. If you do not know Jesus Christ in the pardoning of your sins, if you have never been saved, if you have never repented and confessed your sins, because I guarantee you believe in God. You sitting in here, you believe in God. No matter who you are, I know you believe in God. 